Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here, and we're playing a little bit of catch up on the channel because of the logistics of the course itself. Um, in the week that I'm talking about in this video, we were online and so the entire class session is recorded. We're not gonna put those out, but it also meant that we didn't really need recap videos for the students. So a little bit of the sense of urgency was gone and we were online because I wasn't feeling super great. But I thought I'd record a brief recap just to give us a placeholder of where Mansfield Park sits in our tour of Austin and games. This is one of the weeks where we don't have a direct corollary um, in terms of a game adaptation of the novel. And that's not super surprising when you think about there aren't that many TV and film adaptations of Mansfield Park. There are not a whole lot of rewritings of Mansfield Park for popular audiences. And one of the challenges of discussing Mansfield Park is that that comes from a hesitancy to grapple with the novel itself. It's one of the longer novels. And so I paired it with a short essay by my dear friend and colleague, Marcos Gonzalez, who is an academic memoirist, writer, thinker, who has written about Austin, not as an inherent Austin scholar, but as someone who comes to Austin with a great deal of love care, attention, and complexity. I teach his essay on the whiteness of Austin in every class where I teach Austin, from the introductory correlate all the way up here to the grad level. And we were lucky in this grad seminar in the second half of class to have uh, Dr. Gonzalez come to us virtually and talk to us about why he loves the novel, why he would adapt the novel and how he might, um, and basically turned the conversation really fruitfully uh, because I'd kind of let the discussion rip in the first half in terms of most folks don't like Fanny, most folks like don't like this novel, and liking is not a, a prerequisite to careful analysis, I firmly believe. And so we talked about the challenges of Fanny, especially in comparison to the other Austin heroines. She is often critiqued as passive. Things happen to her. And this is true, and it is a fair critique, but one that requires some nuance. Fanny is the least powerful of Austin's heroines. There are other heroines who are poor, but almost no other Austin character is as friendless as Fanny Price. And we find out about this in the very first part of the novel. Uh, as we've been seeing across the weeks, Austin has a tendency to give you the world, which is to say the family connections of uh, the main character or characters and so that we can understand literally where she is coming from. In the case of Fanny, as I kind of planted the seed for students the week before, Fanny is the descendant, the daughter of a character who lived through a variation of the Lydia Bennett Wickham story. So we are told that Fanny's mother was one of a set of sisters and those sisters made different kinds of choices. One married for money, one married for security uh, into um, a kind of church family, and she was the one who married for love. Mr. Price isn't wealthy and they have a ton of kids. And this isn't Austin's normal, like, I'm poor, so I only have like a five bedroom cottage sort of poor. What we find out later on in the novel is that they are full to bursting. They have almost no kind of meaningful help, especially for the volume of children at home. It's overwhelming. And so it's a very different world that Fanny is then plucked into when her aunt, who is married into Mansfield Park, the titular estate of the novel, 
um, and is given the chance at more education and a better life, but in a place that is so incredibly sterile. And as the implications, we are told more or less explicitly, it's not as obvious to a modern reader, but is very obvious, uh, would have been very obvious to an 18th century audience, an early 19th century audience. This is blood money. This is an estate that is built not just indirectly on the exploitation of labor, but the actual enslavement of other human beings in the Caribbean. And Fanny is very aware of this. And uh, so much of the action is in, it kind of connected to the ways in which the absentee landlord goes away, comes back, and all hell has broken loose. So this is a different kind of morality. This is a different kind of meditation on social relations and dynamics. Fanny doesn't have any leverage either in her place of origin or in the place she finds herself for most of her life. And she's got to figure out where she's going to be in the world and her touchstone the guy she's going to ultimately marry is her cousin who has instructed her. And by the by Austin's kind of moral world standards, as we kind of see them expressed in a lot of other places, she gets a good education. But we are also shown throughout the ways in which her own instructor is fallible and falls for Mary Crawford, who's often been compared to to the beloved Elizabeth Bennet. So hashtag it's complicated. This is not the light and bright and sparkling world of Pride and Prejudice as Austin described that novel. This is a morally complex world where there's lots of difficult choices to be made. Um, true love is a question of action and choice far more than immediate attraction uh, and its logics or illogics, which makes it less fun. Um, but I think a novel that I come back to for its richness, and that's why I was really grateful to Marcos for coming and helping me tag team some of the ways in which this is complex. Uh, we also introduced some of the ways of reading this text and other Austin texts in ways that give us insight um, through a queer reading lens, um, even through an ace reading lens. I'm thinking about how desire both moves parts of the plot in ways that are really kind of anxiety producing, um, but also um, hard to pin down in one way or another, which is all to say this is a fascinating a potential novel to try to transform in terms of thinking about its moral landscape into all of the alternate universe scenarios, right? What would it mean to turn this narrative into a branching narrative? What would happen if, you know, Mary Crawford got her way? What would happen if Fanny had said yes to her first proposal as opposed to st being able to stand her ground? The one action she takes in much of the novel. It's a good hypothetical exercise. And so that's kind of where we left it. We're also going to continue this kind of focus on texts uh, for another little while, just by virtue of the fact of the nature of what was getting published and when. We will get back to games in a couple of weeks, and I look forward to talking more very soon. In fact, I'm going to go record the next video. So see you in a bit for Emma.